Alright, so in my last video I told you about the difference between NeoPixels and non-addressable LED strips, and so now we're gonna dive in a little bit more to the non-addressable ones. If you're feeling confused, feel free to check out the previous video. As I mentioned before, these come in waterproof and non-waterproof versions. I usually go with the waterproof ones because I can put them out on my bike or skateboard or whatever, but you can use the cheaper non-waterproof versions which don't have this silicone coating if you want to just put them in a room or whatever. The cool thing about these is that they often come with a remote control system which you can run off of the provided 12 volt battery controller, which has a barrel jack like this. And then you use the included remote, which is infrared, to turn it on or change the colors or whatever. And there's a wide range of different colors that they'll usually give you, as well as some different animations. <laughs> My other strip over there is freaking out. This is a super janky replacement of the barrel jack with a 9 volt battery connector. Please don't do this. You can also do it by just getting a 9 volt battery connector that has a barrel jack on it and that'll make your life way easier, but I was rushed and whatever. The point is that these will run off of 9 volts as well as 12 volts. They'll just be a tiny bit dimmer, but honestly in the dark of night you can tell. As the batteries get low, the red channel will start to show up more, so if you're fading between colors, <laughs> then the purple will look more red, and so will the yellow, since the green and blue channels take more power to run. The cool thing about this is that many of the remotes are compatible, and so if you and your friends both have your bikes done up with these LEDs with remote controls, you can have a sweet set of matched bike lights and anyone can control them. However, this isn't always the best way to do it. Of course, you can also use a holder that takes eight AA batteries or whatever, but that's a little bit more of a pain and also more e-waste. Yay! Not yay. If you want to keep it a little simpler, or if you've still got some strip left over from a previous project and you've already used the controller, then you can also solder directly to these. Here's a circuit that I'm working on for my bike. I've connected the power to a switch, and we'll go over that later, and my wiring is actually a little confusing because the blue wire is putting voltage in, and then it's going back to ground through this red wire, which is on the red channel. In order to solder to these guys, you're going to need to strip them first. And that means peeling back this silicone covering, if you've got the waterproof ones, like so. And then you can snip that off and solder to the pads. As with all LED strips, you want to cut them right down the middle here. They've got a handy little scissors logo to help you remember that, but it's the same for NeoPixels or whatever. Always cut down the middle of the pads. Once you've soldered to your strips, you'll need to protect them, both from the elements and from flexing. So for stability and waterproofing, I like to use heat shrink tubing that's been filled with hot glue. You basically just squirt the hot glue into the heat shrink, and that both provides enough heat to shrink the tubing and seals the joint. For wire-to-wire -wire connections and splices, just do it how you would normally do. Strip all the wires, tin them, attach them together, and make sure to put a piece of heat shrink tubing on before you solder everything, so then you can slide it over the joint and then then shrink it down with a lighter or whatever. You can keep it as simple or fancy as you want with switches. My circuit is going to involve both this triple pole double throw switch, we'll get to that later, and this single pole double throw switch for switching colors and for toggling the power to two separate circuits. Super cool. Let's take a look at how that ceiling works real quick. I've got my heat shrink and my circuit's all soldered up, so now all I need to do is inject some hot glue into here. I try not to worry about being excessive, some of it is going to drip out, but that just means that you're going to have a really nice seal. And then I use a lighter to finish it up. And really shrink it down. Ooh, you can wipe away the excess. Certainly not my cleanest job ever, but not bad either. When you're ready to attach this to your bike or skateboard or whatever, just peel off the 3M backing and that'll help you place it. It's not very stable long term though, so what I do is place it along the tube, stick it down, and that holds it flat, and then I lay down a bead of hot glue along either side, which sort of fills in the gaps between the cylindrical tube and the edge of the tape, and gives it a little more sturdiness. If you go to my main tutorial here and scroll down to the first example, you'll find a bunch of other circuits that I've set up with this. So examples using transistors, ones with just like a smart Arduino brain. As fancy as you want to get, really, you can do that with this. Multiple strips running multiple colors with 9 volt power sources and whatever. 
all kinds of stuff. I also set this up as a workshop, so if you want to help your entire neighborhood glow brightly, then I'm not gonna stop you. It's a pretty cheap workshop to run. The LEDs come in five meter lengths, and so you can chop up each strip into a few kits, and it ends up being about $10 per person, which is super rad. I would a lot about three to four hours if you're teaching this, just because it can be hard keeping everyone on the same page, but it allows for lots of creativity and people get a ton of satisfaction out of practicing soldering or learning if they've never done it before, and then having sweet, awesome, safe bike lights that keep them super visible at night. Shine on!